12. Biblical Time and History As we have seen, time is commonly confused with sin and death, or else sin and death are seen as necessary aspects or consequences of time and history. Because of this, mutability has long been an unhappy theme in literature, and time a destroyer. John Keats, for example, in his Ode to a Nightingale, sees no real escape from the painful realities of time into an ideal world. Attempts to flee into the ideal world of natural beauty, as symbolised by the nightingale, are futile. Reality accompanies him everywhere. The result is a deep sadness, of which the Ode on Melancholy speaks. Essential melancholy Keats found not in unhappy things, but in beauty, joy and pleasure. Because in all these things there is always our consciousness of time's flux and decay. Thus Keats declared of melancholia. She dwells with beauty, beauty that must die, and joy, whose hand is ever at his lips, bidding adieu and aching pleasure nigh turning to poison while the bee mouth sips. Aye, in the very temple of delight, veiled melancholy has our sovereign shrine. Though seen of none save him whose strenuous tongue can burst joy's grape against his palate fine, the soul shall taste the sadness of her might and be among her cloudy trophies hung. In 1821, Percy Bysshe Shelley expressed similar sentiments in his poem, Time. Unfathomable sea, whose waves are years, ocean of time, whose waters of deep woe are brackish with the salt of human tears. Thou shoreless flood, which in thy ebb and flow claspest the limits of mortality, and sick of prey, yet howling on for more, Vomitest thy wrecks on its inhospitable shore. Treacherous in calm, and terrible in storm, Who shall put forth on thee unfathomable sea? Being humanists, these men and others reeled at time rather than sin, because it was a necessary article of their faith that death is a natural and inevitable aspect of time. Granted their presupposition, their conclusion is a logical one. Man's original sin is his desire to be his own God, determining good and evil in relation to himself, in terms of his knowledge, purpose and experience. Genesis chapter 3 verse 5 The true God is the Eternal One, He who lives beyond time and is the creator of space, time, the universe, and every living creature. Man, in the context of time, is trapped in a world he never made, caught in the web of a universe of causality, and hence man's hopes of, quote, realising, end quote, his autonomy and divinity, are rendered futile. In this situation, man refuses to see his sin as the evil. Instead, he ascribes to time, a condition of his creatureliness, his own moral disease, the cancer of sin and death. The cost of this confusion is a great one, however. If time has as its necessary aspects both sin and death, then the meaning of history is sin and death, not life and victory. This appears clearly, for example, in Sigmund Freud, for whom the will to death is basic in man. The will to live is inseparable from man's desire for incest, parasite and cannibalism, and id, the pleasure principle in man. However, the ego, the reality principle, is forever bent on suppressing and killing man's most basic impulses, so that man's being is essentially suicidal. In any and every faith or philosophy which makes sin and death inseparable aspects of time, it means that sin and death, which are moral facts, 
are converted into metaphysical facts. They then become aspects of ontology or being rather than ethics or morality. Intellectually, the moral problem is sidestepped, but at the cost of life? Because man's life is lived in time, it follows that life has sin as its necessary shadow at all times, and death as its conclusion. There is then no really valid escape from sin and death. As a result, not only the Neoplatonists within the Church, but the humanists outside unite in a common disbelief in and hostility to postmillennialism. Heaven and the totality of the new creation after the Second Advent become remote and unreal, because both time and life are seen as inseparable from sin and death. The thought of life apart from the curse and life and work without the impediments of sin and death, Revelation chapter 22 verse 3, seem unreal, even to those who profess such a faith. Their minds are too clouded by this false connection between time on the one hand and sin and death on the other, as necessary aspects of created being. Angels are, for this reason, unreal to them. Where this confusion between time, sin and death exists, time is then neither a blessed wealth and an ally, but instead an enemy to the would-be God. The goal of history then becomes either an escape from time or the overcoming or arresting of time. Then too, time must in some sense die for man to live. With a false view of time, man can overvalue the isolated moment, separated existentially from God, man, past and future. In the existential moment, man denies the reality of sin and blocks out the world of death. He does this by affirming his own radical autonomy and freedom, and then also choosing or affirming death as an aspect of his freedom, rather than as a necessity governing him. In Sartre's words, Thus, death is not my possibility in the sense previously defined. It is a situation limit as the chosen and fugitive reverse side of my choice. In such a perspective, both the moment and life become meaningless. It is not at all surprising that existentialism leads to a suicidal impulse in many. Existentialism begins by overvaluing the moment in time. It ends by despising both time and life. More than a few philosophies which overvalue time end in the same predicament, however disguised. In John Dewey, time and history are ostensibly strongly stressed, but the individual and his consciousness are downgraded radically, and history is required to give way to the controlled and static great community. The Stoics were at least more open in their contempt for time and history. Their quest for a passionless state was a desire to escape from the commitments of time. Thus, Marcus Aurelius, to further his own abstraction from time, counselled himself and others in these words. Often think of the rapidity with which things pass by and disappear. Both the things which are and the things which are produced. For substance is like a river in a continual flow, and the activities of things are in constant change, and the causes work in infinite varieties, and there is hardly anything which stands still. And consider this which is near to thee, this boundless abyss of the past and of the future, in which all things disappear. Why then, is he not a fool who is puffed up with such things, or plagued about them, and makes himself miserable? For they vex him only for a time, and a short time. There is hardly anything which stands still. This is a grief to Marcus Aurelius, when it should have been a joy. 
It is not surprising, therefore, that his rule over Rome was only a trusteeship over a dying empire, rather than a means to its renewal. Marcus Aurelius sought to restore Rome, to undo time's havoc, rather than to transform Rome. He was thus a custodian over that which, by his philosophy, had to change and perish, because mutability, time and decay, govern all things. It is not surprising also that, in our modern humanistic society, there is a hatred of time, of the clock, and of the calendar. They speak to modern man, not of life and opportunity, but of decay and death. Men once boasted of their advanced age, now they lie about their age, dye their hair, and seek to dress as though perpetually young. Time is an enemy, not a resource. In the prayer of Moses, the misery of time is seen as the consequence of sin. Hence, he prays that men, in fear of God's anger, may take to heart their calling and number their days with wisdom. Only so can men work in time with gladness and song, rejoicing and glad all our days. Psalm 90, verses 11 to 14. Under the blessing of God and with his deliverance, man can walk before God in the light of the living. Psalm 56, verse 13. Or, in the beautiful wording of James Moffat's rendering, in the sunshine of life. To the degree that men walk by faith and in obedience to God, to that extent they walk, not under the curse of sin and death, but in the sunshine of life. Because the problem of sin and death is dealt with by Christ, for them, all such men, as they grow in sanctification, redeem the time. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 16 Colossians chapter 4, verse 5. The Greek word, exagorazo, redeem, means to buy out, that is, to buy a slave out of captivity in order to free him. Moffat here feebly translates redeem as making the most of time. To redeem the time, therefore, requires that we see it as something separate from sin and death, and as a, quote, pure, end quote, Titus chapter 1, verse 15, aspect of a creation which God pronounced to be very good, Genesis chapter 1, verse 31. We then feel no fear of change, nor do we exalt it as our hope. Our hope is in neither the aspect of change nor permanence in the created realm, Our standard is from the Word of God, and is the Word of God who cannot change. Malachi chapter 3 verse 6 Time gives us the opportunity for maturity, for growth in the knowledge of God, for growth in holiness and righteousness, and for growth in dominion. Moreover, our ability to work and to rest depends on our view of time, There is no true Sabbath for those who see time as decay, sin and death. Rest then becomes a grim reminder of the victory of the grave. Work then also is haunted by the shadow of death and corruption. Time, the clock and the calendar become symbols of the inevitability of death and decay and the hatred of the clock becomes natural. It is the prayer of every Faust in every age, like Christopher Marlowe's Dr. Faustus, that time may cease and midnight never come. To Faustus, it is a horror that the stars move still, time runs, the clock will strike. Biblical time and history move towards the Sabbath year and the Jubilee, when Dominion Man rejoices in his holy freedom and rest. He is free from debt and slavery. He rejoices in the fruit of his labours, and he rests in the ease of victory and dominion. Time is not a threat to him, nor a reminder of death, but the area of life 
work and rest, of power and dominion under God, 